Hi everyone, I'm Gail Silverman. Really excited to be here today. And also considering the select group of people we have in here, I wanna open up the invitation to make this a little conversational as we're going through here. So feel free to take the risk with me and jump in and ask a question as it comes up. I wanted to start by talking about when I'm just introduce myself. So I'm Gail. I'm very passionate about communication and the ways in which we talk with and communicate with each other, whether it's asynchronously or talking directly to each other. If you ask anybody who works with me, I'm known for saying two things can be true at the same time. It aggravates a lot of people, but I think it's true. You'll often hear me greeting people in our offices by saying, hi, friends. Sometimes if you're on a Zoom meeting with me, I also like to throw in a little bit of a go team as just a way to say goodbye to everybody. So I am a principal delivery lead at TXI, which is a 70 plus consulting company for digital innovation. And I work in product and execution, which I think is really important because there's a lot of engineers here. Deeply love an engineer. I am just curious if I am the only non-engineer in this room right now. If you are not an engineer, I would love to know about it right now. Oh, thanks, there's one. Yay, you. So I wanted to start, this is one of my favorite, I have a pair of images for everybody and I wanna talk. Does anybody in this room know what this is? It's the Little Mermaid. It is a statue in Copenhagen. It's actually in the middle of a beautiful park, beautiful promenade. You could take a bus there. When I went to Copenhagen, I did my tourist duty. I ate a lot of open-faced sandwiches, I took a bus ride. I went to see the Little Mermaid and I walked up and I thought, this just feels like such a magical moment. Like somebody created this and it withstood the test of time. And it's just here and appreciated and people are still interacting with it. And then I tell people, this is what it looked like when I took that photo, right? It is, there is a lot going on there and in a good way. There's this guy, he looks like he's about to fall in. He's got a friend giving him some help. There's a lot of people, a lot of talking, a lot of languages. And to me, this is sort of the dichotomy of software and working in teams, right? When we only look at the end product, it's beautiful and amazing, and we hope that it weathers the test of time. But actually, there is a lot going on behind the scenes that we all need to know about. So I think to myself, when I think about working in teams and I think about building products, which I've been doing for 20 plus years, and it's been pretty amazing, is it gets a lot easier if we talk with each other. A lot. All the time. And so I am really curious, if you are on a development team, when is the last time, in the last week, have you had a conversation that lasted longer than 10 minutes with someone who does not have your same job, role, or title? That is amazing. That's great. Do you mind sharing what that might have been about? Sorry, the question was... If you had a, a conversation that lasted longer than 10 minutes with someone who does not have your same job, So this gentleman worked with his product manager quite a bit. I also am a product manager, and I deeply love that. I would like to meet your product manager as well. Maybe we can evangelize together. Anybody else have a conversation similar to that? Yeah, I mean, I talk to my product manager all the time. We can have long conversations about priorities and what needs to be Yes, I love that. I'm on a personal campaign to get us to all talk to each other pretty transparently pretty frequently because I think it makes it a lot easier to build things with integrity in a way that feels fun and provides a lot of valuable code and experience. So I am here because I really reject the idea. I think there's this kind of urban legend that engineers and product and designers are often kind of at loggerheads battling with each other. And I have been working with engineers for a really long time and I just, I reject that premise. I don't think it's true. I've learned a lot from engineers. Uh, I've learned enough to be super dangerous, so you should keep that in mind if I ever come to visit your desk. I have learned how to drop an entire production database with a line of code. Um, and I think that that is just, um, I think the other thing I've learned from engineers is, this is my secret, I've learned how to never accept the word no. Every time I have a conversation with an engineer, often it's the first response is no, and then it sort of morphs into, 
well, maybe, and then it's mm, probably, and then it's yes, we can. So I wanna thank you for in, uh, instilling that stamina in me as I try to represent the needs of the user and the rest of the business. So I think the key here is we wanna to work together to fight the problem, not the people. And so I think in order to be able to be in a position to fight the problem and not the people, what really helps is being able to talk about what's on our mind in a kind, compassionate way. And I think the key to doing that is what I would consider an integrated team. So an integrated team is what I would consider represented by multiple people in the organization. So there are some engineers, there's probably some product strategy, there's a project manager, a delivery someone. And I think the key thing here is not to get hung up on titles. When we work together, I, it really doesn't matter to me what your title, what your level is. I'm really curious about your perspective and your point of view. I think that we can find that engineers are often extremely good at product. There are designers that can do a lot of code. There are product managers that sit somewhere in the middle. And so if we can start from a place of nurturing, collaboration, and communication, that's really where we're going to take our first step to making progress. I also want to stop here for a minute and talk about the difference between cross-functional and integrated. So to me, cross-functional means that we have representatives from lots of different disciplines and lots of different departments. That is not the same as working in an integrated team. To me, an integrated team is having continuous conversation and growth. They are making decisions as a unit. They are deciding what is the most important thing at that time, and they are figuring out who is the right person to lead that. And they are able to have really healthy, constructive conversation about that. So that is an integrated team to me. So with my definition, I am curious who feels like they are working on an integrated team. All right, yay, you're at one. Bummed about these two right here who work with me. <laughs> so if we talk about cross-functional teams, and I'm gonna say this even in agile ones because I have been working in agile software direct, uh, delivery for a long time. I think even when we work in integrated teams, sorry, cross-functional teams, we can still feel what's a handoff, right? So for those of us who are working in Agile, we're used to kind of like learning as we go and making the best decision we can and giving ourselves permission to pivot as long as it's valuable to the business and to the customers, but it can still feel like a handoff. And I'm specifically interested in this handoff here because I find that in a lot of my experience, there are well-meaning product designers who are still throwing wireframes over the fence and then moving on to something else. And that feels like a really missed opportunity here because some of the richness around how we can de-risk things and have some integrity in the code is to have some of those conversations together. And the other thing is when we do those kinds of handoffs, it's not actually clear to me when we're done, right? Like we haven't necessarily talked about getting to an output. We might have delivered a feature, but how do we know if that moved the needle anywhere? So what I really want us to do is I urge us to, to step back and try and think about working in a different way. And that way it would be in an integrated team. Also, it took me a long time to draw that circle, so I would love for everybody to take a moment to appreciate it. <laughs> so in an integrated team, we collaborate together in each phase of the work. We really try our best to avoid siloed handoffs, and we're working in continual incremental progress. And so the way that we kind of think about this is, first we want to learn together what the problem is, then we're collectively going to figure out what to do, we're gonna build just enough to learn, and then we're gonna figure out if we got to the outcome. And the way that we're gonna do that is when we first start, we're gonna talk about what does success look like, what success looks like, see, even the train agrees with me, what success looks like before we start building anything. I am curious here who, before starting to build any major new initiative, has a conversation with really explicit success metrics. Yes, Sarah. Job well done. I, am, I feel like that's such an interesting thing because there's a lot of enthusiasm when we start a build and there seems to be a kind of this idea of like, oh, well, we'll know success if we see it. But I really wanna push back on that. We know success when we can measure it. When we can measure it, we can make some informed decisions about what to do next. And that might be building on more, it might be retrenching, it might be pivoting, but there's a lot of power in the measurement. So what happens if we don't work in integrated teams? Well, friends, we have silos, right? Design lives in a silo, back end lives in a silo, front end it lives in a silo. 
We all live in a silo, screaming into the void about who did this thing and why. There's a lot of misalignment and our favorite rework. I feel like the number of times, has anybody here ever um, been working on something? You spend a lot of effort, a lot of your energy, and then somebody tells you something at the last minute, and you're like, well, if I would have known that, right? I have, if I would have known that, that feels like one of the most painful, painful parts of development and delivery. And then there's our favorite rage, because nothing feels better than spending all of your time and effort building a thing that turns out not to solve a problem. So I like to avoid rage. So the way that we can do this is by trying to work collaboratively as an integrated team. And I'm not gonna read this whole thing, but I do wanna stop on these two points, which is the first thing about an integrated team is I think the characteristics of an integrated team are that you can say things clearly and kindly in a way that they get your message gets received by another person. And as part of a healthy integrated team, you have to be able to disagree and commit. So that looks like constructive, compassionate conversation. We need to be able to have a point of view to be able to talk with each other about it. And if one of us does not have our idea or recommendation acted on, we need to be able to collectively like put down the baggage and face forward and keep doing the next thing. It is very, very hard to do. It's very, very powerful if you can figure out how. I think the other thing is around the see something, say something mindset, which is, I feel in any given conversation, there's usually someone who senses something first. Sometimes it's an amazing positive opportunity. That person is like, hey, if we do this now, we're gonna get this great thing. Sometimes it's a person who's like, mm, this is not passing the smell test for me. So how do we create space in our teams where that person feels like they can say something without it being perceived as negative and having a poor impact on that conversation? We should be nurturing that. I feel like it gets names like contrarian or like naysayer, but really that's the person who had the instinct first. And I'd really love for us to be able to nurture it and be able to have really constructive conversations and elevate that. So some other key outcomes if we work as integrated teams is we're gonna have fewer silos. When we have fewer silos, it means that there's less context that we have to pass to each other. We can probably work faster. We can probably deliver value more frequently. That feels good. We have more representations in discussion. So when I have a conversation and I'm representing, in theory, part of product, and I, I want to challenge my own statement there, which is everybody represents product. Everybody represents engineering. Everybody represents design. It shouldn't, I would love us to break down some of these perspectives in the way we see each of our individual roles within a team. And we should all be working towards the business outcome and what's valuable to our user and be less concerned about our individual entrenched perspectives. So when we do that, we actually de-risk things in a pretty significant way. We elevate lots of voices that might not otherwise be represented in the room. And we start to build a shared understanding of what we're going towards. And that shared understanding is really hard to do sometimes because we often start software development projects in a place of a lot of ambiguity. We're not really sure. We might not know what the problem is. We might not know what the solution is, but we are committed to making whatever it is better. And then this last part is my favorite, which is when you have continuous collaboration, you have continuous growth. So I don't know of very many people that are super excited about being stagnant for a long time. So when we work with other people, when we learn other people's perspectives, when we start to learn how to look at it through a design lens, through an engineering lens, through a product lens, we grow. We grow rapidly and consistently. That helps us do our work really well. It helps us be excited about coming to work. And it makes us interesting people, I think. Also calling out some people don't want to grow. They're in a stage of life where they're just resting and rejuvenating, and that is OK. I want to call that out. But for those folks who are really spurred on by that particular combination, I think integrated teams provide a great way for us to do that. So the principle behind an integrated team really boils down to when we start, we want to define the outcomes we're working towards. So I think. Who here has just been delivered a, a description of a feature and someone has been like, great, go do this, right? Uh, I don't love that. It might have value, but I don't love that because I don't necessarily understand the outcome, where we're trying to make the impact, where we're trying to move the needle. So integrated teams, successful integrated teams, I think start from a place of being able to discuss what they wanna do based on outcomes 
rather than features. Features might drive the outcome, but they aren't the sole driver. We want to be able to tie that back to the business. I think it was um, Heidi who was talking earlier today and mentioned that she had a product that she felt deeply and personally connected to, and she realized it didn't necessarily fit within the business lens. We want to make sure that we're there. And then lastly, we want to measure success, which is what I measured, what I mentioned previously, which is how are we going to know that we did this thing? Like, when do we get to celebrate? I am a celebrator. I will cheer for you. I will give you kudos in the Slack channel. I will tell everyone I know that you did something amazing, but I have to know how we got there and when we got there. And that's where measuring success comes in. So our ideal collaborative state is something that I would consider continuous discovery and delivery. Uh, I currently work in an environment where we try our best to do uh, continuous discovery with dual track scrum. So we're doing all the things all the time, sometimes in different proportions. I would love to know who is familiar with the term continuous discovery. All right, we got a few. Uh, I want to give a little shout out to Teresa Torres because it was her book, Continuous Discovery, that got me super obsessed with all this. So now I can pass that obsession on to you. But it's the idea that we want to learn about the opportunities try to define them, then we start to build in an agile way, and then we measure. So we always want to do just enough to understand, do we have a hypothesis? Is that hypothesis true? And how do we know by basic looking at measurements? I want to stop here for a minute because I recognize that I'm throwing a lot of what may be some new things for people, integrated teams, continuous discovery. If you are a person who's like, hey, Gail, I got a question about that. How was your moment? or you can find me afterwards. So once we, if we're starting from a place of, hey, we want to be a collaborative team, we want to work in an integrated way and communicate openly and collaboratively, and we are going to focus on our outcomes as we learn, build, and iterate, this is what it might look like if you're stepping through the process. And I'm actually going to try and use some real examples from the team that I just rolled off on. It was about 16 months. It was a blended client team, which is really great. If you haven't gotten the chance to do that, I highly recommend it. But I want to start with the discovery phase, which is where we're trying to learn about what are our opportunities and what are the user's pain points. And the first thing I want to call out is a huge shout out for any engineer who is in discovery and listening and immersed into research. That's my number one recommendation for how we can add some value to this entire process. Because if we're not in the room, if we're not hearing from the users, if we don't understand what we're really trying to solve, then it just feels like we're trying to move puzzle pieces around without actually knowing what image we're working towards. So that is, I think, the number one thing I would say. We also want to make sure that when we have multiple perspectives in there, we're talking about things from a feasibility, a desirability, and a usability standpoint. The best idea in the world, the best solution, if it cannot be implemented or can only be implemented after a huge complex effort, I don't know that that's our first option. We also want to plan for technical discovery. I would like to know, for those folks who are doing discovery work in their organizations, do you include technical discovery? Yes. OK. What are the kind, do you mind if I ask what are the kinds of things you look at with technical discovery? All right, thank you for letting me put you on the spot like that. But I will tell you some of the things we're looking at. I was like, is there a tool that we can use? How does it fit with our tech stack? How might we optimize for some of the processes that we already have here? Do we need to reinvent the wheel? Or can we find something that is already there that we can embrace and then just add on to? I also want to call out the discussion around discovery, around whether a next big bet should be technical or experiential. And I would like to tie this back to another conversation that I heard it go to, which was Emily's conversation around tech debt, which I think uh, I agree with her. We should call it something else because I think it's more in line with code base health and building uh, a future strong path for us. So having a conversation in discovery around whether or not our next big bet needs to be technical or something user facing, I think is pretty critical. When we move into the definitional phase, this is where we have some insights, we have a good hunch about what we might want to do, and we want to learn more about, we've landed on a problem, there's a lot of different ways to solve problems, how might we work together to get this done? I want to call out that everyone ideates. So when we have a concept workshop, and I had one, I think the last one might have been a little while ago, having engineers represented in there. I think that somewhere along the way, we sort of lost this idea that um, having multiple disciplines in the room actually creates more opportunity. 
than anything else. And so I would like to have a huge amplification of the value of having multiple roles in the room whenever you have concept testing. We also want to validate user ideas from a user and a technical perspective. So once we go back here, the greatest idea in the world, if it's not technically feasible, does not get us very far. I do not like to get excited about things that cannot happen. Help me be excited about them. Let's do some technical validation here. And then the other thing I want to highlight is prioritization with all disciplines. So in my last project, we actually worked in product increments. They were roughly eight weeks long. We understood from the business what was really important. And also, we had conversations with design and tech about what we should include. So that included updates to some infrastructure, to some of our tooling. We were making decisions about prioritizing technical things based on how important they were to our future choices and our future selves. This is an actual example when I talked about having engineering in the room during discovery. I previously had a project last summer. We were trying to help a nonprofit. Their goal was to try to understand how they might connect grassroots system builders. So if I am in my local community and I am trying to make a difference, either through early childhood education or some public programming, how might I find other people who are either doing similar work or complementary work to mine? And so one of the inspiration photos that someone brought in was Zillow. What if we had a Zillow for social services? What if I could find out who in my neighborhood was actively working on library programs or early um, uh, making sure that there are school, healthy school lunches, that there are gardens? So that was their inspiration. We took their inspiration in the second panel was what we use for concept testing. What does that look like? So we ran concept testing. We actually had, I think, four or five different concepts that we were testing with users, trying to understand which is better, not just the one we like better. Anyone ever have that? I have to cry that little voice in my head sometimes. And then as part of that, we started to see that this middle panel was getting a lot of traction from the people in the community. They were saying, this is something we would really like to see. It would be great if I could put in some parameters and understand who in my zip code is actually doing that thing. And so we got to a point that said, great, we have a lot of energy around this idea. It seems to be solving a problem for a lot of people. We have some research to help us understand our confidence interval in this bet. Now it's time for us to do a technical prototype. So we found some open source data and we were using it. It wasn't even like we didn't decide which library we were going to use or which tooling we were going to use. Just is there a tool out there that we could use to test this? And we did it and actually gave us enough confidence to decide to move forward with that recommendation. So I always think of this experience as the ideal way that those three disciplines can actually combine and amplify the work that we're doing together. So next we get to the build phase. My favorite part, lots of talk, lots to do. So the first thing I want to really advocate for is cross-functional pairing sessions. I feel like engineers are really great about having pairing sessions with other engineers. I would like to up those stakes and ask people to start having pairing sessions with designers and product. I had the gentleman over here was having a conversation that's close, so I'm going to take it. I think it's incredibly valuable because when we get used to talking with each other on a regular basis, we get really good at it and we can have some of those more nuanced conversations. And I think that goes to also what I would call creating a culture of being able to surface unexpected complexity. I think every one of us has probably been in a project where design comes up with something and tech looks at it and they're like, yeah, we should be able to do that. And I'm also pretty sure that there are engineers in this room who got to something and they're like, this should have been easy and it's actually just really messy and it's gonna be really hard. Maybe this isn't worth the value. So how do we then turn that conversation into a positive instead of just a slog? How do we allow ourselves to pivot? How do we make a good choice that's in the interest of providing value to the client, to the business, and to the team? And we do that by having a culture of surfacing complexity. We also have to get really good at negotiating. So I think all the time, everything is a trade. The way that we win is by being clear on what the outcome is and what we're getting and what we're giving away. So if it is very important to the business to have a particular feature and it's going to have a heavy technical lift, that's not a bad thing, but let's be clear about it. I would like to know from engineering what this group might have to trade in order to make that thing happen. 
I also want to make a call out for asynchronous reviews of all of this. It does not have to be done in person. I love people. I will talk to people all day long. You know what? Sometimes we don't need to talk to people to do our work. We can comment in documents. We can comment in Slack. There are all kinds of ways to do it. I am a big fan of making sure. It's the fact that the communication happens, not that it's an actual verbal conversation. The other thing I'm a big fan of is who in this room has a UX check before things get passed? Oh, yes. Oh, I love. We're doing great. So I just, in my previous project, our QA process was um, we tested through QA, a team member. Sometimes it was me. Sometimes it was an engineer. Then it went to someone in design to make sure that it looked and it had that fit and polish, that the spacing was right, that the font was right, that it was true to the designs. And then it got passed to somebody from the product owner. You can save yourself so much time. That scramble for fit and polish at the end, it does not need to happen. It can be a part of everything we do in every day. And so I think the other part of this is just our ability to have ad hoc collaboration. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. The being able to have ad hoc collaboration is a skill in and of itself. So I don't want to dismiss how hard that can be. This is an actual example of a conversation I think one of my teams was able to have because we have some good patterns around conversations and being able to talk to each other pretty clearly. We wanted to reduce the manual update of information. So design really wanted it to kind of be like a fun experience. They found this library. They wanted to use the country code flag. And so design actually asked engineering, here's the design I have. Is this viable? I found a library. I think it fits. The tech lead was able to look at that research and make a call really easily because of that interaction. So to me, this is the kind of thing I would like to see happen quite a bit which I think we have a lot of missed opportunities, or maybe we can just cultivate more opportunities. And in terms of measuring, I also want to make a, a plea for everybody who is engineering product design to also look at the measurements. Like when we look at analytics, digging into, are we having this experience because it's a technical issue, because it's a design issue, because it's a flow issue? If we are looking in isolation without team members at those analytics, I'm not always so sure that they have the integrity that we think we do. So having those conversations, I think, is really important. So if you are thinking to yourself, well, gee, Gail, this sounds like a great way to work. I would like to do it. I wanted to give you some suggestions for how you might get started. So the first thing we need to do is we've got to build some empathy for each other, right? I need to understand what it's like to be a tech lead. I need to understand what it's like to be an engineer. And I would like my fellow team members to understand how sometimes difficult negotiations happen over here and I am also having some, some unique challenges of my own. So I think the three ways to do that are actually to understand how to practice talking to each other constructively. Let's learn how to say hard things without it being weird. That is my challenge to everybody, right? Sometimes we make it weird because we just decide it's gonna be weird. We also need to commit to be working flexibly. Many of us are in remote only environments that opens up lots of options for core hours and things like that. We have to be willing to privilege both our individual preferences and our team preferences in a healthy way. And the best way to do that is probably establishing some norms. And I feel like I have been, my heart has been so full as I've gone to so many of these talks around team agreements and norms. And I think there was a speaker today who had the stickies of how are we going to have constructive conflict and how are we not going to have constructive conflict. Those are really important conversations to have before you have the conflict. It's a lot easier to know how to do that when you're not in the thick of it. So a couple of suggestions that I would have, and I want to focus on this one, radiate information consistently to people outside the room. I do not like to be in meetings that I do not need to be there. But I love to know what happened in those meetings. So how do we create a culture of radiating out information to people who aren't in the proverbial room? Maybe it means you update the calendar invite. Maybe you use a tool like Notion. It doesn't matter. It just matters that we make it a practice that if a couple of people are having a conversation and there's something important that we discuss or uncover, that we just surface it to everybody in the team. An integrated team deals with those challenges together. It does not mean they have to be in every single conversation altogether. That would be a lot of time together. And then I also want to talk to um, this one, confidently raise an issue when you're the first person to spot it. Uh, I've been talking about this for a little while. I have, has anyone heard of the Abilene paradox? Well, we're going to hear about it now. So the Abilene paradox, so if you're in a room, 
you got a group of like 10 trusted colleagues, you're trying to decide on something, and someone says, I think we should do, you know, we should make decision A. And you think to yourself, a little voice in your head is like, I don't, I don't know about that. But you sort of look to your left and you're like, oh, well, you know, Jane is over here. I really trust Jane. She's not pushing back on this. It must be okay. Like, I'm looking over here. Sam's not pushing back. We must be okay. But what's actually happening is collectively, each one of us is like, mm, it doesn't feel right. But no one says anything. And then later, we follow through on that decision, and everyone in the room was like, I didn't really want to do that. Right? The Abilene paradox is this thing where we don't speak up because we think somebody else who judgment we value or who might have more institutional knowledge about a thing that they would have said something and the fact that they didn't made us feel okay with that. So I would just say like this goes back to this whole thing about being willing to be the first person to say something when you spot something. You have to confidently raise it. Integrated teams will confidently raise issues when they spot them. That's the way to get ahead of them. Also, a small plea for this one, say no to requests without shame, judgment, or fear. That isn't like I refuse to do my job. I mean, doesn't work that way. But we need to be able to kindly say no to people when they ask us for things that we know that we can't do or aren't reasonable or are not going to have a good return on our, our time value investment. I love to tell this story. This is an example of a story that I think is funny only because I have a team that is able to speak really transparently together. So we were working there. There were three of us. I was in a conversation I was the product lead, we have a tech lead, we have a design lead. And we were talking about interaction patterns. There's some navigation down here, right? So two of these are feeds. So we're having a conversation of like, hey, if I'm in the home feed and I've scrolled halfway down, and then I move to the special interest feed and I scroll halfway down, and I go back to the home feed, what's supposed to happen? And all three of us were in agreement. We were like, oh, where you were, where it should stick. You should go back to where you were. And then we had the conversation about like, okay, well, how do I get back up to the top of the screen? And myself and the tech lead were like, we just tap on the top of the screen, like it takes you right up there. And the designer was like, yeah, it does do that, but also you should be able to double tap on home. And we were like, what are you talking about? And he said, this is a common interaction pattern. It's in everything. Like, have you used any social media in the last five years? And we were like, well, yeah, like we use a lot of social media. And so he was very insistent, like, go back and try it and see what happens. And so we both did, and we came back, and we were like, you know what? You are absolutely right. Neither of us knew that. I don't know whether it was a function of our age or the media we were using. It doesn't matter. But that could have been a really contentious conversation. Instead, it's something that is, our team finds very funny, and we make fun of it all the time in a really um, healthy way, is what I would say. But that could have gone really wrong. In another organization, in another team where we did not know how to talk to each other and constructively push back with each other around the why, it could have just been three people separating with hurt feelings, and that's what we want to avoid. Integrated teams avoid that scenario. So the other thing we want to do is we want to optimize for the practice, the team, and the individual. I actually, this is my favorite Kanban board of all time in the lower right-hand corner. Has anybody seen the movie Fargo? It's the wood chipper guy. That's an actual Kanban board that is in use at one of the sites that I had been. You want work to be visible. If you require access to a system to understand if something is being done, your team is not working in an integrated manner. We want to democratize our use of tools. We don't all need the same security level, but we need access to it. If we are not operating from the same set of information, how can we possibly learn how to talk constructively together? I also want to talk about this one, don't block the box, the intersection, right? So they tell you, like, don't block an intersection, four-way intersection. If you are working in an integrated team, you have a little higher level of risk that you might get in each other's way because you are doing things together in real time collaboratively. So it requires an ability to kind of have foresight around what might become a blocker, how design might block engineering, how product might block design. Those are conversations we should have, and we need to be very proactive about understanding. Before I switch from the slide, is there anything else here anybody wants to ask me about? I can talk about all of them. I also, I'm going to back up for a minute. I want to highlight this one, respect practice principles. Within an organization, departments actually often have cultures within their own. So I happen to work at a consulting agency, TXI. 
uh, many of our practices actually have their own principles. So my awareness of this as a team member actually helps me support my other team members. So I did include this just so that when I share the deck later, you could see they're a little abbreviated here. But the idea here is there are sometimes factors outside individual interactions and team interactions that actually inform and can help make richer conversational experiences for us. The other thing we want to do is establish team norms. So we have to be clear on what makes each person thrive. And I have, I wrote an article once called, I think that there should be an IN team. And I stand by that. Because I do think that teams are made up of individuals. And when we each recognize the best way in which to support each other, we can actually do very good work together and lower some of the friction points. And I'll start with myself. Uh, when I go to team agreements, I tell everybody, I really love talking to people, but I do not love talking to people at 11.30. I start my day at 7 and I need lunch because I get really cranky. So I tell my teams in our team agreement, please don't ask me to make any big decisions at 11.30. We'll both be sorry about it. So that is an instance where my team can support me individually in a way that does not hold them hostage to other behavior, right? Like it is not, a, it is not an excuse to bend a group to your will. The IN team helps us understand what's important to each of us individually so that we can work in an integrated manner. So things that you want to talk about are pairing styles. Anybody here have open pairing hours? I have a teammate who has open pairing hours. And one of our other colleagues who's new to the team said, OK, what does open pairing hours mean? Does it mean I can just jump on the Zoom? Does it mean I should make an appointment? How do I know if you're using your time for pairing with something else? and by having some of those explicit discussions. So you wanna talk about like, what are the things that are going to impact us day to day that we can talk about now in advance so we set really healthy norms for us as we work as a team. Also, I'm gonna make a call out for embracing people's work love language. Everybody likes to be appreciated. Everybody feels appreciation in different ways. Maybe appreciation is a public thanks. Maybe it's a private thanks. Maybe it's asking somebody to take an extra few hours off on a Friday because they have just been going like full tilt and they need a little bit of a break. So know people's love languages. That's a great way to create a healthy, integrated team. I'm going to pop back here for a minute. This is an example of a team agreement. I don't think we need to run through it except for I will talk about if your teams are not having explicit conversations around what growth they are looking for as part of their projects, you are missing out. This goes back to that loop that I said earlier around continuous collaboration yields continuous growth. Let's have those discussions instead of making a guess. We also want to understand how to be curiously constructive. That's the phrase that I've landed on. So how do we ask questions that we think in our brains, right? Like, I have an uncensored part of my brain. It often needs a little filter before it makes it out into the world. So here are just some examples if you're looking for in any inspiration around how to have some harder conversations with some of your colleagues or you're a little out of practice, um, the inside way you think about it and the external way you might ask about it. So this is my favorite. How many of us have looked at scope or looked at design and been like, we do not need that? All right. So I think having the conversation around, like, how often is this really going to happen? Is it an edge case? Sometimes there's value in dealing with it. Sometimes there's not. We also want to look for anti-patterns, right? So becoming an integrated team takes time. I have been working in this way for five plus years. I am still learning all the time. My teammates are still learning all the time. So one of the things you can do is, if this is not a practice that's coming naturally to you in your organization and you're trying to get it off the ground, you can look for any red flags. And I think the biggest one is this one, hoarding information. Hoarding information is an indication of a silo. Silos are a big no-no within integrated teams. So trying to understand the driver behind that. People often have, people don't do things for no reason. You might not like their reason, might not resonate with you, but there's usually a reason. So let's find out. And then you want to look for resistance to negotiation. And my personal favorite, decisions by side conversation. Anybody ever go to a decision meeting, like do all your information, you think you land somewhere, and then everybody sort of scatters into the proverbial remote hallways, and a couple people are talking over here, and a couple people are talking over there, and all of a sudden, before you know it, the decision you came to as a group is different somehow. So in an integrated team, we have those conversations transparently, so you want to look out for any decisions made. 
via side conversations. So I have a couple suggestions if you're interested in learning more. You can reach out to me. I, you can read the book Continuous Discovery. I also included my colleague Kara Carroll has a really great pairing checklist. So um, I'd strongly recommend you can check out that link. And I also wanted to leave time for us to talk a little bit about just if you take a nugget, if you're on the plane and you take one thing away from this, which is do all the things and do them together. That is the way an integrated team works. Thank you.